Good afternoon. I'm Cheryl Scullis here at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I'm glad to have the chance to talk to you today about um, manure safety. My slides aren't the prettiest. This has been a fast moving couple of days as we did have a recent incident here in Wisconsin on Monday. And as we try to look at the facts, um, sort out some of the information and address some of the, the safety issues and help get you guys some current information and get us keep us all thinking about safety. As Rick was talking about accidents, I thought in my role as a safety professional, there is no such thing as an accident that we always look at, you know, what are the causes, how we can prevent that. So with that, we're gonna look at um, two recent cases, but I also put a third case in um, because of the audience here today and just wanting to, to make you aware of some different factors around this. And here are um, the cases we're gonna look at, one here in Wisconsin, Michigan, and Ohio. And then we're gonna talk about accessing exposure, manure gases, and other safety measures. So this past Monday, unfortunately, and with great sadness and sympathy to the family, a 29-year-old farmer was found out uh, alongside an outdoor, non-enclosed manure storage. And typically when we look at a lot of the, the safety and we're talking manure gases, we're talking confined spaces. And the fact that this was outside um, was a different factor. In addition to the, the farmer, they lost 13 head of cattle immediately and then three other um, animals were, I'm not sure if they were put down or died um, as a result of this one. And they weren't discovered immediately um, when they were there on scene by law enforcement and the coroner. So as they went about that day's activities, they discovered these animals. The individual had gone out early in the morning. Um, timeline is still kind of coming together, but somewhere, you know, 4, 4.30 to start agitating the manure in this um, outdoor non-enclosed storage. And shortly after six o'clock, an employee found him later followed by a custom hauler who came on site. So the one of the big factors here that they were looking at is this is not our confined space that we would be looking for. And a question got to be, you know, what factor does the weather play in this incident? And the coroner is a pilot, so he made a couple calls and discovered that there had been um, an air inversion in the area that, you know, may or not turn out to be one of the significant factors. As we've looked at it here in the biological system um, department with some of my colleagues that, you know, Becky Whit Larson, who some of you may know as our bio waste specialist, Dave Kamalar Structures, John Schutzke, another egg safety specialist, Jeff Nelson, who is our rescue specialist. Um, we're looking more at the overall weather factors that led up to this. One, you know, we've had some warm temperature, that slurry is sitting in the storage, that break of release is at, of the gases as the agitation is starting. So, you know, why yes, there was an air inversion that morning, um, not sure that that is as significant a factor as, you know, the other weather factors that were playing into it. High humidity, very calm winds, and so there's always going to be the risk of, of these gases around any of the manure um, in, sto in storage. Um, we're currently waiting on the results of any, you know, blood samples that the coroner had and, and toxicology report. So we will be, you know, looking um, further at this one. So just a couple of, of current comments on it. And So on Friday, um, August 12th, which was just um, uh, the week ahead of the incident here in Wisconsin, there was a fatality in Michigan where the individual um, entered a, a typical manure pit, um, one of the reception pits, eight feet by eight feet by 12 feet is what was reported. 
I've seen anywhere from 12 to the 18 inches of slurry in the bottom of it. His wife had commented that he had entered this numerous times. And once again, you know, what's the weather factor? How is this going to be um, factoring into that gas movement, um, ventilation needs for this space? And anytime we're looking at these types of places, we need to remember our confined space procedures. We need to be looking at, you know, properly air monitoring to know what the gases are and have we got it ventilated out. And also, you know, was there somebody that could have been as a standby attendant um, to help in retrieval? And we unfortunately here in Wisconsin had uh, an incident in a similar type of space in um, July of 2015, and we have. Um, we're just in that county last Wednesday doing a farm rescue training for both farmers and rescue personnel. So when this one I found last Friday, it was sad to, to see the incident happening. So this one happened in October 31st of 2015. And I found this one looking through some of the citations on OSHA.gov. And the part of what I wanted, why I wanted to mention this one um, for this group is here was a situation where the employee was checking the fill level of the tanker and he had crawled up or climbed up on top of the tanker, was looking in the hatch and was overcome by the hydrogen sulfide. So if you think of that tanker filling up and as that slurry is going in, then, you know, that those gases that are in that tank, um, the, atm the atmosphere in there is being pushed out. So that was a direct line for those gases to be coming out and into that individual's tank. The bullet points, um, the smaller bullet points were uh, pulled from an OSHA citation, one of the citations given to this farm. And I just wanted to, to share some of those with you as you look at what, is, what do you need to do in your safety program to help meet the, the site, um, prevent being, you know, getting the citations, being in compliance and, and factors to look at. So in this case, they were looking at, you know, um, to prevent that release of air with a hatch, to have a gauge that the, the build level of this tank can be monitored from on the ground, along with you know, some of the other administrative controls um, of creating that no personnel zone. Some of the other recommendations were towards the, the personal protective equipment, as well as including some of the personal gas monitoring equipment. So this is a case that if you have individuals that are loading up at the tanks, um, to take in consideration citation what it could to what to put in your state. So with that, um, those three cases have several different, you know, factors um, that we're looking at and that we always need to keep in mind as we're addressing our safety. We need what is your exposure in the job? Just look at the, the image on this slide, and I kind of like this one um, because it's out there in this rowboat, possible hazards to the situation. And if you're that employer, your question is, you know, what am I going to do to reduce the risk of this individual? being you know injured from doing this and of course one of the first thoughts is can we do this a different way so we're not putting an individual out there um, in the middle of the boat without any other protections so as you think about the situations ask yourself that question of you know what's the exposure to the situation for those of you that are working with employees, um, just wanted to remind you that a lot of our agriculture, a lot of our um, manure storage and, and, and handling types of citations are going to fall under the OSHA general duty clause. And so you're looking at, you know, having that place of employment 
um, that that's free from a recognized hazard that you know likely to cause death or serious physical or harm to his or her employees and it applies when there's no specific standard and so for some of those factors that we're looking at um, it makes it harder because it how do you know if there isn't a standard what what you can be doing and that's where it's good that we're having these discussions um, and looking at the safety recommendations that should be put in place. Um, just wanted to provide you a list of some of the other consensus standards that can be looked at, um, even though it's not an OSHA um, factor that there are a lot of consensus standards. And if you look at those to, to help guide you um, in some of these areas of development of your safety programs. So again, when you look at the surface, what risk do you see? You know, if we're standing there, it, we're not doing anything around this outdoor storage facility. Um, you know, our greatest risk might be if there's no fencing that somebody could, you know, fall into this outdoor storage area. But now what's the risk that you're going to see? And this is a situation where we start agitating and now you know, we're closer into where that manure slurry is. So we've seen drowning incidents. We're agitating it up and we have those gas releases um, and what you, you could be exposed to there. Rick did a great job of discussing some of the mechanical factors with the equipment. So that storage area that we're looking at, we start putting in and we start agitating. And now we have a whole different set of risks that you need to be looking at. So some factors going back to um, each of those cases that we, we want to remember to, to think about. When we have this manure in storage that it is going to be undergoing an anaerobic um, decomposition process, that process is more active in high temperatures. And, and in those last two cases that we were talking about, that slurry sitting in storage is going to be a higher temperature. Um, the case on Monday where, you know, we know the air temperature above was cooler, there wasn't the wind, um, kind of creating that situation of where is that, those gases that are being released in agitation going to go? And once we start breaking those crusts, getting it stirred up, the gas is re releasing, we want to be, be looking at those factors. Reminder of the gases that we're talking about. Some of you may have seen some of the current articles um, related to Monday's incidents. And, um, you know, methane is, is certainly mentioned several different times and it is a factor. It, remember that this is the one that's lighter than air and it is an explosive gas. Um, along with ammonia, another lighter than air, an irritant. Um, but it is also one that in low concentrations, you could have some respiratory factors that come into play with that ammonia. It's not going to be in the high levels um, that we might see with, like with the hydrogen sulfide. Carbon dioxide, heavier than air, our biggest thing with hydrogen or carbon dioxide is that it's displacing the oxygen. And then hydrogen sulfide, and hydrogen sulfide is the one that in a, you know, a number of our cases that we look at in confined spaces and you know, working around manure slurry or any decomposing plant material um, and in the petroleum industry, you know, this is the heavier than air gas. It is rapidly absorbed um, by the lungs. Um, it is looking for escape from the slurry. It likes to travel low and will collect in low line areas. So we break that crust, we start agitating, that hydrogen sulfide, this mixture of gases um, are coming out, and especially with that hydrogen sulfide, you know, it's looking to escape, and we actually, you know, refer to it as the, the soda pop gas and, and that release. And then we go back to Monday when you think about that, that area having, you know, that cool air, that hydrogen sulfide staying low, Where's your agitator? Where are you coming in contact? Um, that agitator is creating a little bit more air movement in the area. And then, you know, projecting like where they found um, the cattle. We're looking at mapping that out. 
and how these gases may have traveled into that, that area given some of their characteristics. You cannot know that these gases are present. Um, you know, yes, hydrogen sulfide in very low levels will have a smell to it, but at the higher concentration. So it really takes using, you know, the air monitoring to know. And I think the case on Monday really shows that we just don't, we just can't rely on that. It's not going to happen um, when we're out in that open air that we do, and we just don't have the mixing potential there. So when you're looking at facilities, when you're going to farms to do work, if you're doing the custom operations, you know, you have to look at your confined spaces and have the programs and the plans to address entry into those confined spaces that you're setting this equipment up as you're looking to ventilate spaces out. Where are these gases going to travel? What other workers or employees might be influenced by them? What other livestock or what other buildings could they go into? With the weather um, or other ventilation factors, where are we going to be pushing these gases to travel or where can they possibly collect? So there's a lot of different safety factors. Um, and when we look at these different incidents, um, just different, different considerations to the different spaces, but knowing the basics that, that manure slurry is going to be producing these gases, we do have to be looking to address them, looking at using those air monitors and, and following safety procedures. So with that, my time is up.